Okay. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Ms. Wagner. This is Ms. Steed and Mr. Obermeyer. Today we're going to be talking to you about Chapter 15 from Teach Like Your Hair's on Fire. In this chapter, Rafe discussed how in the uh, times that he had free time or recess, he would let kids come into his room and talk to them about how to play guitars. And he would teach them different guitar choirs, and he eventually got drummers and piano players and started a band with his students. This sounds a lot like um, School of Rock, the movie, if you've seen that. Yep. Uh, but he said, he says the difference between his school and the School of Rock is that he teaches the kids how to read music and how to make music rather than just play one song. Um, so, a question for you. Do you guys like music? Have you, raise your hand if you've been impacted by music in your life, whether a song got you through a tough time, even if you just get a song stuck in your head all the time. All right, now put your hands down and raise them again if you consider yourself not musically gifted. Yeah? See, people can be impacted by music, whether they're musically gifted, whether they like to participate in music, whether they like to take a bunch of classes in music and learn about that, but everybody can be impacted by it. So today we're going to discuss how you can integrate music into your classroom, even if it's not a music class. So the chapter was called It's Only Rock and Roll, but I like it. Some vocab that we think would be important for you. First, audiating. I'll talk about this more later, but it's basically when a musician sits and thinks through his part, reads the score, and can actually hear the pitches sounding and the rhythms, but no sound is actually produced. This really helps with like looking ahead and being prepared for your music. Voice matching. This happens in choirs when people, people with their voices have different tones. Uh, some people, like me, have a darker tone. I have a relatively low speaking voice. Um, and then other girls might have high, airy, breathy tones. When they sing, you want people who sound similar put together. So it's just trying out different combinations. Sometimes you might think something works and it sounds horrible. And it's nothing against either singer, but it's just their tones don't blend. And then scores. Scores, we're going to pass a couple around right now so you can see. They're just written out pieces of music. You guys can look at these. Um, and you can call them different things. You can call them librettos. You can call them books. Um, it's just a way of writing out sheet music so that composers can explain what they want their, uh, their music to be performed like. Decibels. Decibel is the volume level. This is how we put a number to volume and make it quantitative. Um, for a reference, a normal speaking conversation is about 60 decibels while a hairdryer is at 90. Fireworks are all the way up at 140. Um, it's just a way of measuring volume. And lyrics. Lyrics are a just the words of a song. These can be in any language. Sometimes they're not even real words. Uh, one of the songs in the black binder has just la 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 as all the words written down. Um, now I'm going to discuss how music classes can be academic. Sometimes we look at music classes and say, oh, they're just for creative outlets. Oh, it's great to let kids express themselves with music. But they're hard. Music is hard to do. Like if you looked at some of the things, you might just see a bunch of black dots and lines. Um, but musicians know how to read that and how to interpret it. And it takes a lot of cognitive work in music classes. Uh, first off, there's multiple focuses every time you're making music. You have to be listening to the other parts being played, singing or playing your own part, making sure you have correct pitches, rhythms, watching the conductor, keeping the beat, putting emotion into the music. If you're singing, you have to be focusing on correct punctuation and uh, like, uh, pronunciation of the words. If you're in a band, you have to be thinking about uh, where you need to go with the music, how it fits in with the other parts. Um, if you're in a musical or marching band, you have to be thinking about physicalization, physicalizing it and moving your body with it. And you have to be remembering proper technique so that you're doing all this in good health so you can do it forever and not hurt yourself. That's a lot to think about. Um, this is one of the pieces that we're singing right now. I got it and looked at it and I was terrified because it's 
just a lot of things to look at on the page. Um, and then language. Uh, especially, I'm going to talk about vocal uh, music. This is good because it teaches you different languages. I personally have sung in English, Spanish, German, Italian, French, Latin, Arabic, Native American, and I knew what every one of those pieces mean in a gen general sense. For instance, this is a German piece that I sang two years ago, I know what that means because I sang it in a choir two years ago and I can still pronounce everything correctly. It really helps you to be able to implant different things that might be foreign and foreign sounds into your uh, normal speech patterns. Reading music. Like I mentioned earlier, it's a bunch of dots and lines. Um, but musicians know how to interpret it. It's almost a language in itself. So first you start off with just five lines. That's it. And then this is called a staff. It can be either bass, treble, percussion, or tenor staff. And the most common that I sing in is treble. Um, so this is what a treble looks like. And then you add time. This tells you how many beats are per measure and till the pattern repeats itself. Then you break up the lines into smaller chunks. So you'll have four big beats in each one of these little sections. Then you can add pitches and rhythms. The placement of the dots on the lines tells you what pitch to play, and then the long the shape of it tells you how long to play that note for. Then you can add things like dynamics. The P is piano, uh, that's very soft. The double F is fortissimo, that's very loud. And then the um, we call, I call them hairpin dynamics because they look like bobby pins. Uh, just tell you to grow into it rather than just going stark contrast. Those are just the basic things. From there you can add different diction things, words, uh, and then different things to tell you how to put weight on the notes, things like that. Mental problem solving. This comes into play with the audiating that I was talking about. Uh, the director can ask their students to audiate by uh, singing through it in their head. This helps with mental problem solving. They can say, oh, preemptive strike, look at this problem spot that's coming up in measure 48. Sing through that in your head a couple times, think of how it sounds, and then when the whole choir gets together, because they've already looked at it, they know how to breeze through it and it's easy. Um, this is very similar to doing a math problem where you call back from things you've already done and figure out how to put it in this context. Now Mr. Obermeyer will be talking. All right, so now we're on integration in the music classroom. No matter if you're music inclined or not, you can integrate music into your classroom no matter if it's just playing a little bit of music, or if you're teaching kids music, or if you're or if you're just just music and anything. A lot of things come from formulas presented presented rhythmically. Even if that includes chance. So like for a math problem you could include chance to remember addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Um, science formulas to other other science things, I don't know what the formulas are, but you can do that. <laughs> um, well, in a lot of high school and middle school classes, you do a lot of like solo work or group work. And so while you're not teaching, you can play some music in the background. Um, that helps kids work and focus, and it's not all silence, and they don't, they're not afraid to speak to their classmates or to you as loudly as they need to since music's playing because when it's silent I know that I don't feel like talking to other people because it makes me feel awkward. Uh, show real world, exam real world examples. So when you are doing, there has to be a reason you're playing music or doing music things. So you want to show real world examples. Like if we're doing chants, you want to show that um, other cultures also do chants to memorize songs and other things like that. Team building. Music helps bring people together as a team. Um, I, I know personally that I can't do anything on my own musically. Um, singing, I need to be with other people, makes me feel more confident. Playing with other people makes me feel more confident. 
Team building is a big thing that comes from music everywhere, even if it's just in a classroom or if it's actually a music class in general. Either way, team building is a very big part of music. Okay, so there's different ways you can integrate music into the classroom. At elementary, it's more chants and rhythms and stuff for them memorizing, or it could be uh, singing to them, helps them learn better. Um, in middle and high school, it's more playing music while they work by themselves, playing music while they work in groups. You can't really do much singing or chants in middle school and high school. It just doesn't work as effectively. How does, it, how does music affect children's lives? So there's different ways children learn. Auditory, musically, visually, and those all help with um, teaching children anything. The auditory learners can hear the rhythms or the chants to help them memorize. They can hear you singing so they can learn. And it also reduces feelings of stress and anxiety in people. Uh, musical interest, so if you're like interested in music a lot and you know you are, this could help you learn a lot better. Um, I'm interested in music a lot when I started in middle school and that helped me learn a lot better than I ever like learned before. I was getting higher grades, I got my GPA was increasing, my grades were like A's and B's in middle school. Like, music helps me learn in many different ways. Um, it helps children regulate their emotions. Children have trouble controlling emotions. And so music helps them express their feelings in different ways. They're angry, sad, happy, excited. No matter what their emotion is, they can always pour it out through music and it helps them express themselves instead of speaking or acting out. It pr improves connect concentration on task, based, on task behavior. So with music playing, for me and a couple of my classmates that I went to high school with, they always said that playing music helped them focus and concentrate on what we were doing. If it was math, science, English, writing, um, it always helped me get my like creative, my brain working for especially for writing because if I'm writing like a <coughs> short story or something, I always like to take lyrics from songs that were playing or songs that were stuck in my head. It helps me just get like through whatever we're doing because I've always struggled with like those common core schools and stuff like that. Enhance the way children can process language and speech. <coughs> Music has been proven to enhance speaking and language itself. Um, it depends on the type of music though, because some music is damaging to your brain. Music is processed in both hemispheres of the brain. So music can enhances both sides of your brain. It uses parts of the left and parts of the right to help do more connections with school. And now Miss Steed will speak. Music's effect for special education. Of course I had to sneak this in here for you guys because it is near and dear to my heart as an intervention specialist. So, number one, music is nonverbal. It said where words fail, music speaks, which is so true. For a couple of children I work with, words fail them on a daily basis. Just imagine how maddening that can be. I have a particular student who She's not completely nonverbal. She gets some sounds out, but speaking is quite hard for her. She works with a speech and language therapist. And a way for us to teach her how to say her name is we taught her to clap it. So if she walks up to you and goes, that's her saying her name. And now after a few years of doing that, she can walk up to you and say, look away. So the rhythm of music can be very impactful, and it just warms my heart to see her come up and say her name every morning. Next, music and visual supports increased comprehension, which kind of blends into favorite songs as a teaching tool. Um, our students, we let them pick their favorite song, and then we let them do research. Like, what is this song talking about? What feelings does this song make you feel? Because some of them, 
they get confused with feelings. They don't completely understand how someone else is feeling. So it's a really great way to help them understand feelings and to learn about that and to see like this song is sad and they can hear how it's not as upbeat as other songs. As I said, rhythm is your friend with the name and the clapping and also to teach them. Um, so sorry, mine went blank. That's okay, teachers do that. <laughs> to teach them lessons like a math equation or something to go along with that. And also brain breaks, which isn't only special ed, but over my observations, I've only seen it implemented in a special ed classroom. I haven't seen it in other ones, which was surprising to me, but I know in my MH class that I work with every day, at some point when we see the kids just getting completely stressed out, we stop, we clear out the tables, we pull up a just dance, and we let them dance and sing and just shake it all away. Words, music, and volume. Lyrics and music largely mimic the same effect as audible speech, forcing you to focus on the words rather than your task at hand. Um, if you moderate the music level to 70 decibels, it is found that it actually forces your brain to concentrate harder and more ideal than lower levels of ambient music. Imposing sound on the brain can cause an increase in abstract thought and creativity. So anything higher than 85 decibels is found to impede your creativity. So with that being said, the good types or styles of music that are appropriate are sound they're kept between 70 and 85 decibels level wise and they have no words such as jazz, classical, video game music is actually, I, I never thought about it until I played a game and I was like wow that's really soothing and natural sounds like white noise in the background not so good are the reggae, pop, metal and rap because of all the words and it can just completely confuse you on what you're focusing on. All right, so now we're gonna do a group activity. So if you guys would split into groups of high school and middle school and then early childhood. Go ahead and get up. Yeah, why don't high school and middle school come over here? All right, so what we're gonna do, we've kind of listed off a bunch of different ways, different things that you could uh, with rhythm or singing a song. So work together with your group to come up with either, like for high school, a formula or uh, some science fact or even a history fact. See if you can think of anything that you can put to a rhythm to make it more memorable. It could be something that you found memorable in uh, your schooling, uh, early childhood. You can come up with days of the week or like colors or something. Uh, anything that you can put together. So we'll work for about five, three or five minutes, and then, or if you guys finish earlier, we can share them with each other sooner. We'll hit. Yeah. 
<laughs> and like I said, like when I was in like my modern American history class, like they my teacher incorporated the song Weed and Start the Fire and it up and saw like history in that song. Yeah. Like so I know and I think there's a lot more things there's people that are actually I can't just like say that. Yeah, you know, it's not just I use it for science all the time. Like the water cycle, what they like. I love science. Oh, so yeah. Oh, 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 yeah.
discussed about that you could integrate music into a non-music classroom and go ahead and write those down on your exit slip. Mm -hmm. If you're teaching math, how could you integrate music into your classroom? precise and practice movements required. But inside their brains, there's a party going on. How do we know this? Well, in the last few decades, neuroscientists have made enormous breakthroughs in understanding how our brains work by monitoring them in real time with instruments like fMRI and PET scanners. When people are hooked up to these machines, tasks such as reading or doing math problems each have corresponding areas of the brain where activity can be observed. But when researchers got the participants to listen to music, they saw fireworks. Multiple areas of their brains were lighting up at once as they processed the sound, took it apart to understand elements like melody and rhythm, and then put it all back together into unified musical experience. And our brains do all this work in a split second between when we first hear the music and when our foot starts to tap along. But when scientists turn from observing the brains of music listeners to those of musicians, the little backyard fireworks became a jubilee. It turns out that while listening to music engages the brain in some pretty interesting activities, playing music is the brain's equivalent of a full body workout. The neuroscientists saw multiple areas of the brain light up, simultaneously processing different information in intricate, interrelated, and astonishingly fast sequences. But what is it about making music that sets the brain alight? The research is still fairly new, but neuroscientists have a pretty good idea. Playing a musical instrument engages practically every area of the brain at once, especially the visual, auditory, and motor cortices. And as with any other workout, disciplined, structured practice in playing music strengthens those brain functions allowing us to apply that strength to other activities. The most obvious difference between listening to music and playing it is that the latter requires fine motor skills, which are controlled in both hemispheres of the brain. It also combines the linguistic and mathematical precision in which the left hemisphere is more involved with the novel and creative content that the right excels in. For these reasons, playing music has been found to increase the volume and activity in the brain's corpus callosum, the bridge between the two hemispheres, allowing messages to get across the brain faster and through more diverse routes. This may allow musicians to solve problems more effectively and creatively in both academic and social settings. Because making music also involves crafting and understanding its emotional content and message, musicians often have higher levels of executive function. A category of interlinked tasks that includes planning, strategizing, and attention to music into a non-music and requires simultaneous analysis of both cognitive and emotional aspects. This ability also has an impact on how our memory systems work. And indeed, musicians exhibit enhanced memory functions, creating, storing, and retrieving memories more quickly and efficiently. Studies have found that musicians appear to use their highly connected brains to 